reducing what you're oh, uh, reducing what there we go. Um, reducing what you're consuming, uh, reusing what you can, repairing everything that you can, recycling if you can't reuse it or repair it, and uh, composting everything else. And so I put a little arrow here because I think recycling really should be like the last resort. You know, you should really try to do all of these other things before um, the end of its, its life cycle because recycling, unfortunately, isn't always, uh, you know, that that perfect solution that we wish that it was. A lot of things don't get um, recycled indefinitely. They might only be recycled one or two times, or they might be recycled in a way that would surprise you. Like um, glass is infinitely recyclable practically, but um, there's not a big market for it. And so a lot of uh, glass ends up being turned into pavement, that kind of thing. So recycling is not the answer. So here we go with our concrete tips. And I just want to remind everyone, again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You do not have to go away from this presentation and do all of these things. You can kind of pick and choose. So everyone asks, how do you start? So start by looking in your trash. Um, see what you are throwing away. You know, what you throw away might be different than what I throw away. So really like genuinely look in your trash can and figure out what is it you're throwing away. And those are the things that you want to work on. Um, so go after that low hanging fruit. Like what is the stuff that you're throwing away a ton of? So if you can eliminate something that's creating a lot of volume in your trash, that's really going to to motivate you to keep doing all the smaller stuff. And so, you know, like maybe um, replacing your plastic toothbrushes with bamboo toothbrushes, like will be like really satisfying, but it's not going to get rid of like a lot of trash. And so I would say, you know, really shoot for the things that you're making a lot of trash in with whatever that is. So, one of the one of the things you can do when you're out in the world is bring a zero waste kit with you. And so your zero waste kit might be different than mine, but whatever it is essentially is stuff that you use out in the world. So maybe it's a coffee cup or a water bottle, maybe um, it's silverware, maybe you eat out um, food storage. Like if you're going out to restaurants and you have um, leftovers to take home with you instead of bringing it home in the disposable packaging. Um, I always have a napkin, like a, a cloth napkin or a small towel in my bag and I use it for everything all the time. So it's, um, you know, it's my hand towel after I wash my hands out in public, but it's also coming in for like a million other things. I can wrap, wrap up little leftovers in it. I can wipe down a wet bench. Like I can do a million things with it. It's like, it's, it's like, a, it's like a science fiction novel. Um, bring reusable bags. I always have two uh, ripstop nylon bags that compress really small that I keep in a little pocket um, in my bag. And I have those with me all the time and use them for everything. Um, straws, if you, if you use straws, you can use uh, metal, silicone, glass straws, there's all sorts of different things. So whatever it is that you use out in the world, just think about how you could replace that with um, items that can be used over and over instead of single use items. And so I feel like this is a good point I wish to say, like, if something doesn't work for you for whatever reason, whether it's a medical reason, whether it's just like, it is just the thing that is going to be the barrier between you pursuing zero waste and you not pursuing zero waste, you can, you can be flexible with all of this, like figure out what works for you. So, um, so right, so I mentioned reusable bags. And so uh, Maine's reusable uh, single use plastic ban went into effect in July, which is great. So, um, you know, I think we're really leading the nation in a lot of ways on um, conservation and reducing um, single use disposables, which is really great. Um, so individual choices add up. So this like pl this plastic bag example, I'm not gonna like, you know, give, give you a lot of data about things generally, but I feel like this is a really great example for how individual choices can be very powerful in the aggregate, that we are not, you know, the only person who exists in the world, there's all of us. And so if all of us were doing these things, um, it can be a very powerful movement. So household paper goods, there's lots and lots of things around the house that, you um, are made of paper that are designed to be <clears throat> used once and then thrown away. 
And I feel like the more you can identify those things and replace them with things that can be reused, that's going to make a huge difference um, in the volume of trash that you throw away. And, you know, paper doesn't exist in a vacuum, even though things like uh, paper bags and cardboard and those kind of things can be composted or reused in different ways. There's a process that makes that paper, you know, it's cutting down trees in the forest, it's going through, um, you know, transportation to and from factories, it's going through a lot of chemical processes, um, you know, those chemicals are extremely toxic. So, you know, sometimes I think about like paper as being a solution because if something is coming in paper instead of plastic, then it's um, reducing, you know, the kind of trash that just ends up in the landfill. But there's a lot that goes into that. So I always sort of think about like, what is the what is the arc of this item's life cycle from the beginning to the end? So that's a bit of a tangent, but you know, you can replace things like um, like uh, paper napkins with cloth napkins, paper towels with with rags and other kinds of cloth. And these aren't something that you have to go buy. You know, you can turn old um, old t-shirts into like hankies. They make great hankies. Or you can turn old hankies into wash rags, um, in, uh, old t-shirts into wash rags. I used curtains to make produce bags. There's a lot of ways that you can um, replace things with cloth. Um, and so jars of hankies everywhere. So Zero Waste Home uh, is one of my favorite zero waste books. Um, when I first read it, I thought it was very aspirational and now it's become very much a lot of the stuff that I do anyway. So it's been uh, fun to revisit that book over time, but it has lots of really great um, practical advice. And one of the first things that I implemented from this book were jars of hankies. And so I have these, you can see one right here, got them everywhere. I have literal jars of actual hankies all over the house um, and it's been amazing. Uh, I didn't realize how many um, Kleenex we were using until we stopped using them. So uh, food, I feel like is one of the hardest things to eliminate uh, packaging with. We still make um, trash from our food packaging. It's very difficult to avoid, but there are some strategies to reduce that. So first of all, whenever you can, obviously choose unpackaged. So if you can get something that does not come in any kind of package, then you are not, um, you're not creating that waste. And so I feel like this is a good, a good time to touch briefly on like the fact that there is of course still packaging in stuff. Like these items are not, you know, coming without containers, but the containers that they're coming in are usually like much larger. And so if you look at, for example, on the left over here, we've got like plastic packages of, uh, of like celery. And so those plastic ba bags of celery are coming inside a cardboard box, like versus like over on the right, maybe we've got celery that isn't in those plastic bags. It's just coming in a cardboard box. So it is reducing, um, it is reducing trash in the long run. Um, and so buying from bulk bins, this is another great example of like, there is still trash somewhere along the line. But if, if there's one like five pound bag of split peas coming in one bag versus like little like one pound bags of split peas, like each of those are, uh, there's far more packaging in smaller packages. So by buying from bulk bins, you're really eliminating a lot of packaging. Um, and so if you do not have bulk bins in your area and depending where you are in Maine, that certainly can be the case, um, choose packaging that's recyclable in your area um, that's compostable, that's sort of the ultimate, like if it comes in paper that can be composted, um, reusable packaging, um, you know, glass jars that you can reuse, and or the largest possible package. So if you have to choose rice in a plastic bag, you know, go for the larger five pound bag of rice rather than the one pound bag of rice because the total surface area of that plastic is going to be a lot less um, with the large pur purchase than many smaller purchases over time. Um, and you know, try to avoid plastic packaging. That is one of the things that's hardest uh, to recycle. So toiletries, everyone loves uh, doing toiletries. They don't make a huge difference in terms of like your you know, 
over the course of a year, how much packaging that you get rid of, but it's really satisfying because you use toiletries every day. So when you're using your bamboo toothbrush, uh, you know, two or three times a day, maybe you're having that moment two or three times a day where you're just like, yes, I am doing zero waste. And that makes you feel really great and like motivates you to keep moving. And so there, you can, you can zero waste everything in your toiletries. So there's, um, for, you know, a, a rule of thumb is if you can get it in a solid versus a liquid, always shoot for the solid because chances are it doesn't need the packaging the way that a liquid does. So shampoo and conditioner, they make shampoo and conditioner bars. Um, and, you know, like with anything else, like not every shampoo will work for you and not every conditioner will. So if you try one shampoo bar and it doesn't work for you, don't give up, try others. Um, it's like anything else where you just kind of got to find what works for you. Um, moisturizer and soap, these are also things that can come um, in solids versus uh, liquids. Toothpaste, you can make your own toothpaste, you can make your own moisturizer, you can make your own uh, makeup and deodorant. There's all sorts of things you can DIY and DIYing um, almost always in the long run will make less trash than uh, making a product that's coming together coming as itself. And that's the same with cooking too. So um, the more you can cook from scratch, probably the less trash you're gonna make. Um, shaving supplies. So in the center of that picture, you can see there is a uh, <clears throat> like stainless steel razor. So I have something very similar to that. It's called a safety razor. And this is what, um, you know, so much of this is what our, what our grandparents did, right? So <laughs> this safety razors, I had never heard of until the last several years, but you buy um, like the metal safety razor and you buy a box of uh, razor blades and that box of razor blades is going to last you for years and years and years. And you save tons of money in the long run. And it works so much better than, um, and some of the things that are available that have like tons of plastic packaging that have like eight blades or whatever they have in them now that cost like an arm and a leg for each one. So that's been something that for me, I really, really enjoy. Um, menstrual products, you can of course zero waste your period and bidets can also um, reduce a lot of like toilet paper usage and that kind of stuff too. And with the toilet paper crisis of the pandemic, I feel like bidets are really having their moment um, there's lots of easy ones um, that you can uh, buy and easily install. So they just, you don't need any um, plumbing skills. You just hook them right up to your toilet. They're great. So take the plunge, the days. Um, repair and maintain. So both of these are kind of like two, two pieces of the same coin. So if you're maintaining something really well and taking care of it, it's going to last a really long time, but inevitably things will probably need to be repaired. And so I'm going to rein in my impulse that I always have to rant about right to repair and how there is um, a real, um, <clears throat> there's a real difficulty, especially with anything that's technology, whether it's appliances or phones or computers, that they're built to be obsolete quickly and they're built to be non-repairable. Like the companies do not want you to fix things. They want you to just buy the new one to replace something when it goes out or when it's, you know, reached the end of its planned obsolescence. So there's a, a big consumer movement um, called right to repair, which is something I encourage you to Google. Um, and there's a lot of legislation around that. Uh, but yeah, right to repair, very important. Um, so repair your stuff, <laughs> it's the nutshell version of things. And so, you know, so many things can be repaired, whether it's shoes, taking them to the cobbler, um, clothes, bicycles, appliances, you name it. Like there are things that can be fixed rather than um, sort of that impulse of as soon as something breaks to just give up on it and um, replace it instead. And repair has actually been something that I and, and maintain as well, both, both are something that I have really found to become a hobby of mine. I've really started enjoying um, fixing all these things that I used to, I, I would just, I would just re replace them, you know? So the whole repair has been a lot of fun for me, especially with um, textiles and repairing textiles. And there's a lot of ways you can turn these things that might be chores into hobbies. And so, um, you know, visible mending, that kind of thing. Um, there's lots of great ways out there to turn fixing things into fun. Um, gift wrapping. So around the holidays, that was absolutely when um, 
the amount of trash that our household produced spiked. You know, we'd go from having a full trash can to having an overflowing trash can with like backups that also needed to go later. Um, just with all the packaging and um, wrapping paper and that sort of stuff. Because at the time, a lot of wrapping paper here in our town couldn't be recycled because it had like, you know, special resins and um, finishes on it that made it um, unrecyclable. Um, so that really prompted me to find other ways of wrapping gifts. So on the um, left here, this fabric wrapping is a Japanese style of gift wrapping called furushiki. And you can Google that. And there's tons of really great videos on how to do this. It looks complicated, but it's super easy. Um, if we were in person, I would do a quick demonstration and show you how to do it. But I can just say, if you've ever <laughs> worked in a sandwich shop and had to like wrap your sandwich up in a piece of paper, it's the same idea. Um, and then on the right-hand side, <clears throat> all year long, I save any bits of string or ribbon, um, brown paper, any sort of paper that looks interesting that comes, um, comes through our doorway. Instead of just recycling it, I save it or composting it, I save it. And, um, and then it becomes gift wrapping at the end of the year. So just by like, you know, cutting some little sprigs off of trees outside in the winter, maybe dehydrating some um, orange peels or apple slices using star anise and other little seed um, things like that. You can make really beautiful packages and people always comment on how beautiful the packages are. And it's not because I'm super crafty or talented at gift wrapping, it's because it just looks beautiful. Um, cleaning. So practically everything can be cleaned with just soap, sun, vinegar, and baking soda. And I realized recently that this is a skill. Like I just assumed that everyone knew how to do this. So very briefly, um, if you think about any cleaning product that you might um, be tempted to acquire or that you have in your home, I would just take that product and Google <laughs> alternatives to it. So for example, um, Windex for cleaning glass, like Windex, Windex is pretty nasty, it's toxic stuff. But you can use instead a dilution of um, vinegar with water, use old newspapers, just like your grandparents used to, or um, just like a cloth or a rag and wipe the glass down and it is spotless and nothing in there is harmful um, to your health. So, or to the glass. So yeah, so I would, if you, if you have a cleaning product and you think to yourself, like maybe there's an alternative, if you Google the solution to that, um, Google will tell you all the answers. Or of course you can always reach out to me too and say like, I have, you know, never had good luck with um, these kind of cleaning, uh, you know, vinegar or soap or whatever. I'm happy to help, um, share tips for sure. So you can reach out to me through the website as well as you can with anything. So laundry uh, produces a lot of plastic and some of that plastic is invisible called microplastics. So when you're washing your clothes, if they're made out of um, synthetic fibers, they shed, all, all clothing sheds little fibers. But if you're wearing synthetic clothing and washing synthetic clothing, it sheds these microplastics, these tiny, tiny little pieces of plastic that are so small that they don't get filtered out by um, municipal uh, water supply. Um, it just continues on into the environment, continues into the fish, continues into the creatures who eat the fish, including humans. Um, it's really insidious stuff. So absolutely one of the best things you can do is uh, when you're choosing your clothing, choose natural fibers because those natural fibers that shed off are just going to biodegrade naturally versus the microplastics, which you not, they just break down smaller and smaller. Um, but if you already have a synthetic clothing, you can, um, there's lots of products that you can use to wash your clothes in. So let's say you have um, a fleece jacket. There are these bags, um, there's lots of different ones, um, but there's one brand called Guppy Friend. You can put your item in the bag and it like catches the microplastics um, instead of just releasing it. Um, seems a little bit like voodoo, but 
they claim to work. Um, static solutions, uh, you can use compostable dryer sheets. You can use wool dryer balls. The wool dryer balls also help uh, speed up drying time because it's fluffing everything and it's absorbing the moisture from the clothes. Um, anyway, speeds up drying time. Um, line drying indoors or outdoors. So with brown tail moth, I have not been able to dry my clothes outside in several years, but I have a tree horse and you can just set that tree horse up inside. Um, you can do clotheslines like inside. Um, so you can line dry items indoors as well. And of course, finally, ask yourself, how often do I really need to wash this? Maybe you don't need to wash that item quite as often as you think you do. Maybe there, um, you know, there are alternatives. So for example, I know that there are folks who will use a, a towel once after their shower, and then they use a fresh towel the next time they take a shower. And for those people, the idea of reusing towels might seem a little weird, but you can definitely reuse those towels for several times um, before you need to wash it. After all, you just got out of the shower. Your body is clean when it was dried off. So compost, I am obsessed with composting. So I have uh, several composting solutions. I have a worm composter, I have a tumbler, and I also have um, one like in this picture here, but mine is not an attractive shade of red. Mine is just a couple of pallets slapped together, um, which I call my slow compost. So depending on where you are um, and what your life is, a different composting solution might work for you than something else. So there's um, a couple who regularly comes to my zero waste stuff around Maine, and they are very into worm composting and they live in a very small apartment uh, in a city and they have like a whole little setup of worm bins on shelves um, like in their entryway. And that's how they do their composting. Um, if you live out in the country, you might be able to just do, um, you know, sort of the classic pallet large compost situation, but maybe the large compost situation doesn't work so great for you because crows get into it or attract skunks or whatever. So maybe a tumbler works better for you. So there's lots of different things you can do, but um, the, the rule of thumb about composting is that you only want to use uh, plant material. You don't want to put um, you know, anything dairy, any animal products, um, that kind of thing. That's going to attract the vermin that you don't want. Um, but you can also compost hair and dust and paper, um, threads from your clothing, or if you are a knitter, um, little bits of like wool that gets snipped off or whatever. So all that stuff can go in the compost. And so you know, sometimes people say composting seems really complicated and like the ratios of greens to browns or whatever. And I, I agree, it, it can be complicated, but I do not do it in a complicated way. So what I do with my composting is like with my slow composter, my um, pallet composter, I mostly use that for yard waste. So um, I used to use it for food and that kind of thing, but I had crows that were just obsessed with my compost and no matter what I did, they would get into it. Um, so I just put my yard waste in there. And then I have a tumbler that I use for food waste and for shredded paper. And then I also have like my worm um, composter. And for my worm bin, I just um, give them like almost exclusively at this point, shredded paper um, and dried and pulverized eggshells for the grit. And then maybe sometimes I'll give them like some greens or something that went bad. But you know, I kind of have like a little system for each one, but I don't worry too much about ratios of browns to greens because I feel like as long as you're adding browns, which is like the dead stuff, so like dead leaves or paper, which is also a brown, as long as you're adding some of that, you're probably in good shape. So don't get too bogged down in um, the details of composting and it will probably work fine. And you can always compost and you can always email me if you're having questions and composting isn't working for you. So find what works for you and keep an open mind. So not everything worked for me. And I feel like people like zero wasters love to confess the things that are not working for them. So like like homemade uh, toothpaste did not work for me. My teeth hurt. I couldn't do it. I needed my <laughs> like, you know, terrible in a tube toothpaste. Like I really love corn chips. Like I still eat corn chips sometimes. Like it's fine. Um, so, you know, have those little compromises. Like compromises, again, this is a marathon. So compromise is going to make things work for the long run. 
Um, so not everything has worked for me. Maybe not everything will work for you. Maybe like some things that work for me don't work for you or vice versa. So just go with what works for you, but just keep that open mind. So um, I think like a, a, a sort of good approach is when you're having to replace something, something is truly at the end of its life cycle, or you need something that you don't already have that you have no way of borrowing or whatever, ask yourself first before you acquire it, is there a way that I could do this that would be in line with my zero waste <laughs> approach to life? So I needed a new pillow. I had an old pillow. It sucked. It really needed to go. It was giving me headaches. It was a disaster. And so I got a buckwheat pillow. So um, I bought a bag of buckwheat hulls. They just came in a paper bag, like literally a grocery bag at my local co-op and I sewed myself like a little pouch and I poured my buckwheat hulls into the little pouch and that is my buckwheat pillow and it is amazing like I cannot rant about this thing enough to you I love it so much and so I wouldn't have thought of that before like it took googling things to be like you know what are my alternatives here what is what is a pillow that at the end of its life cycle I can compost instead of having to throw away so, or like, um, you know, uh, shower curtain liners, for example, I used to always have shower curtain liners and then I, I had a shower curtain liner and it was time for it to go. And instead of buying a shower curtain liner, I said, well, what if I just didn't use a shower curtain liner at all? What if I just use my cotton shower curtain? And it turns out it's totally fine. Like I just wash the cotton shower curtain, you know, every few months and I do not need a plastic off gassing um, shower curtain liner anymore. So just keep that open mind, like keep experimenting with things. Maybe not every experiment will work. Um, maybe you'll hate a buckwheat pillow or maybe for some reason, a shower curtain liner is just like a piece of your life that you cannot give up, but sort of think about things outside the box. Like what are solutions that might exist to this problem that don't require trash? Um, so stay motivated. Um, so I think, you know, having someone that you can talk to about zero waste is really important. And that might not be your partner. So um, I am definitely the zero waster in my house. Uh, my husband is not a zero waster. He's not interested in zero waste. There are some things that he's been willing to, um, to compromise on. But if, if it had just been the two of us, like butting heads over stuff, it would have driven me crazy. But I have this friend, Suzanne, with whom I founded Zero Waste Me. And so I can, uh, you know, bounce ideas off her. And oftentimes she has a solution to something that I, so that I don't have to keep thinking about stuff. Like she already has done that thing and can say like, oh, this is what worked for me or vice versa. You know, so having other people, and it doesn't have to be in person, it can be an, an online community, but find people that you can talk to, um, people who are already having to solve the same problems that you are having to solve. And find things that keep you inspired. So maybe that's following accounts on Instagram, maybe that's getting, um, you know, zero waste books from the library and like reading through that. There's lots and lots and lots of great zero waste books. Um, or movies and documentaries. Again, tons of movies and documentaries. And for me, that's definitely very inspiring. Like if I start to feel like, oh, this is meaningless, like, you know, consumers are the problem, corporations are the problem, blah, blah, blah. Like if I watch a, a documentary about something and I say, that's, that's my trash there. That's something that I'm doing too. Like that helps keep me accountable and keeps me inspired. And to remember like what got you started? Like, why are you here tonight? You know, why, why were you interested in coming to this talk tonight? And if you can articulate those motivations to yourself and you can remember those motivations as you move along, that's also helpful. And then this idea that being less than perfect doesn't make you a fraud. Like I am not a perfect zero waster. Our household still produces trash. I still eat those corn chips sometimes. Like I love corn chips. And that doesn't mean that I'm lying to all of you or misrepresenting myself. It doesn't mean that I need to stop, um, you know, helping others with their zero waste journey. So I feel like there's very much an idea that if you're not, um, 
if you're not 100% at something that you might as well be 0% of something. And that means that there's a lot of like really awesome gray area in the middle where you could be reducing your trash a lot. Like, and even if you only reduce your trash by 50%, if you thought about if every person around the world reduced their trash by 50%, or even just every person in America, like we produce so much trash. Like if every person in America reduced their waste by 50%, that would be a tremendous difference. Um, and don't stop at zero waste because those producers do need to be held accountable. Um, recently, uh, a bill was passed here in Maine, um, one of the first in the country, again, on um, extended producer responsibility that holds the producers of the packaging responsible for how those um, items are recycled, how they're taken care of in the long run. It incentivizes um, you know, uh, producers to use packaging that can be composted, um, that can be reused, that kind of thing. So that's really important. And to elect people who care and will take actions like that. So use that in your rubric when you're deciding who to um, vote into office. Use consume fewer animal products. Now this can be something that really drives people away, like instantly, they're just like, no thanks, my cheeseburgers are important to me. But uh, reducing um, animal product consumption has a major effect on greenhouse gases and other, um, other important climate change effects. Travel less. And I say this as someone who has a long commute for a job I love, travel less. Um, support local everything. So, you know, I used to say support local farmers, support local business, but like, it's support local everything because it's all connected. Um, whatever it is that you volunteer doing, whatever organizations it is that you care about, all of that is connected in some way to local living, local community strengthening, um, and all of that is connected to reducing trash and stopping climate change and doing all the important work that we should all be doing. So just real quickly, um, once again, the website is zerowasteme.org. There's lots of resources on there. Um, I'm not a big content creator, so it should probably be updated, but um, there's also uh, recommendations for documentaries and books, that kind of thing, if you enjoy that sort of stuff. Um, I have all of my upcoming events on there. Um, there's also a zero waste retailers map um, that was created in collaboration with, um, oh my gosh, I'm just completely blanking on her name all of a sudden, I can picture her face. Oh my gosh, go to my website and you'll find it there. Um, but it's retailers around the state. And if you, um, I'm still trying to think of her name, this is so embarrassing. Anyway, um, retailers all around the state so you can see where you are and see what's around you. Um, and if there are others that you think need to be included on that map, there's um, a form there that you can submit as well, and I can add that to the map. And so I'd like to open up the last 15 minutes or so to conversation with the entire group. So what are your questions? Is I, there anything you have clarifications about yeah. or what you do yourself to reduce waste? There are some questions in the chat. Great, oh, Julie. Let's look. Um, let's see. So I will, I'll go through those and then people can, you know, unmute if they want to ask a question, but there were people thinking of things during your presentation. Great. Wonderful. Um, so um, first question, was, how do you think about the use of paper versus the use of water to wash cloth rags? Just the, you know, I just, saw, I just saw a, a question posed very similar to that online somewhere. And I want to say, this is, this is a funny question, because if you think about how much water goes into the production of those um, those paper goods, like that doesn't hap happen without water. And if you think about all the transportation, so if you think about like the uh, the 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 building and maintenance of like the vehicles that transport that you think about all the fuel that goes into that and all the water that goes into all of those things. And then you think about like the actual like consumer end of things, you know, like there's, there's, there's so much water that goes into that, but there's so much more than water. Like if you just think about the chemicals that go into producing like paper towels, like there's, 
there's so many incredibly, incredibly toxic chemicals that also inevitably end up in the environment. Like paper production is one of those incredibly polluting, um, polluting industries. So it's not just about the water, right? It's about everything overall. So I would say, yes, absolutely. The benefits from washing those cloths over and over that you're going to use like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of time over the course of their life with you um, far outweighs in good the, the other side. And another question, how do you handle slash view durable medical equipment? This is plastic that it seems cannot be recycled. I say anything that's medical gets a free pass, like no matter what it is. Like if, if, if this is something that people need for their actual health for any reason, like use it guilt-free. Like there should be no guilt associated with taking care of yourself in that way. And then, um, and then there was a recommendation for love brand shampoo bars there at Hannaford. Um, shampoo and conditioner, one different sense. So somebody recommended that and easy to find at Hannaford. And you know, um, Michelle, right about that, right above that, someone had um, direct messaged me a question too, okay. asking um, if I get much pushback from family members. And so the short answer is yes. Yes, I get a lot of pushback. So, uh, you know, my son who's seven, he's on board with whatever I wanna do, but like he still wants all those like little plastic toys that come in plastic packaging. Um, but I don't buy him those, but he still gets them and the plastic packaging still comes into my world along with the plastic toys. But my husband is not zero waster. Like there are definitely like areas where he has been converted. He loves the jars of hankies, for example. And just a couple months ago, um, he commented on, um, you know, the neighbor's trash cans. He was like, wow, like that, that used to be us. Like we don't even put a trash can out anymore. Like we go we take our trash ourselves to the dump like once every five or six months. And it's like, a, you know, it's a very small amount. And that's so much in contrast to what we used to do. And it's so much in contrast to our neighbors. And that, that totally was us. So he has seen that and has, you know, I think that that was a positive moment for him. But yeah, my husband is not into it. Um, I, you know, like when I go to potlucks or when back in the day when there were potlucks, the thing that I always brought to the potlucks were um, plates and silverware and cloth napkins. And I felt like people loved it. They were like, oh, this is so nice. Like instead of eating on paper plates with the plastic, you know, silverware or whatever. And but it also was like a great conversation starter. They'd be like, who brought this? Like, what's going on? Like who brought plates to a potluck? Um, so yeah, so I think there's ways to start those conversations um, with family members um, that can be a little bit less like, I'm not making trash anymore than like, isn't this a great way to live? So that's kind of helped cushion those kind of things. And then do you know of any cobblers, somebody, said, you know, good luck finding a cobbler oh. in, in our area. I don't think there is one. I'm not sure in your, there is, there is one in Augusta, which I go to mm -hmm. all the time, but um, I don't know, you'd have to There do was one in Westbrook too, mm -hmm. but neither is too close to near, to, to level near him, but. Mm -hmm. um, it might be worth um, Googling it yeah. too. And if you do find one, we can add it to the zero waste map as well. That would be good to have on the map for sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the name of the bag, the question was answered to capture microplastics in the laundry. Guppy friend. Mm -hmm. Guppy friend. Okay. And did you, I don't know, did you see um, the comment about construction waste? Mm. that's a long yeah. one um yes you know, so I to... yeah so um the question is like you know that someone's seeing a ton of construction waste and um you know how do you view what you're doing as an individual versus the huge amount of waste that others produce is it a matter of doing what you can and um what you can control it can be disheartening um so yes it can be disheartening and so I just keep thinking about that um you know, like it might seem overly simplistic, but I just think about like, if everyone was doing this thing that I'm doing, like, 
what a difference that would make. And I feel like you can't expect someone else to do something if you yourself are not doing it. So if I go around and say to everyone, like, stop using plastic straws, but if I'm using plastic straws, then it would be hypocritical and meaningless. And so I feel like this is totally just me, um, but I think of it as that what I'm doing, if, if, if everyone would do that, it would make such a difference and not even everything. Like if everyone would just do some things, like what a difference that would make. And more importantly, by making these choices as consumers, like we are telling producers what we value and what we want to spend our money on. And so if, you know, if it's something as simple as like deodorant in a pack, in a paper packaging, you know? So if everyone stopped buying all of the deodorant that comes in non-recyclable plastic packaging and everyone just started buying the paper packaged deodorant, all of the deodorant producers would stop start making it in paper packaging because they're going to get that message. And the only thing that motivates corporations is money. And so we are choosing, we're, we're telling people, we're telling corporations, what we want by how we're spending our money. So if if Target sells out of uh, cloth napkins and can't move paper towels, they're gonna start, stock a lot more cloth napkins than they will paper towels, that kind of thing. So I think of it as like change moves slowly, but it does change and it can be disheartening, but that's why you gotta stay motivated. And that's why you got to find a community that you can like vent with and like talk about, um, you know, concrete things that you can, that you can do. Like maybe, you know, like there's, uh, you know, legislation. Like if you looked at like, how can you get involved with, um, you know, supporting projects that limit the amount of new materials that constructions can use that they have to like first look for like reusable materials or whatever, whatever it is. So getting involved, I think, helps with that disheartening. And then somebody had a question about recycling plant pots, either plastic or ceramic. Mm. There was an answer that Lowe's takes the plastic ones. And I know some recycling um, entities do take them. I think EcoMain, which is the Casco company, mm. does take plastic ones. But that's an interesting question about ceramic, like recycling ceramic. Yeah, so what do you do? Ceramic can't usually be recycled, but um, you will be amazed what people will take for free. So I had a um, a, a chiminea, like a, a terracotta chiminea that did not survive the winter. It like broke into like several pieces. And I put it on my local free cycle and said, I don't know, maybe somebody wants to use this as a garden planter. And like, 30 people like were begging for this broken chiminea before I said the chiminea is gone like stop asking me about the broken terracotta so like there are people out there who will take practically anything and especially if you can think of like some hypothetical thing you're like I don't know I've got this like broken plant pop but maybe someone wants to like make a mosaic in their garden with it like and people will be like oh my gosh that's an amazing idea so there's a lot that people will take for free and like plant pots are definitely one of them. So like those like plastic ones that just like accumulate, like, you know, if you're a gardener at all, like they're just inevitable. If you can put those on free cycle and people will take them right away too. So. Um, then there was a question about cleaning a metal straw and um, somebody said that spicing grain in Freiburg has tiny scrubbers for metal straws as well as caps to make mason jars and to drink containers. Somebody else suggested pipe cleaner for cleaning mm -hmm. metal straws. Any other tips, Julie? Yeah, I used, I used pipe cleaners. Like I had a whole bunch um, from my kids' craft stuff that I just repurposed into that. Like he had kind of mangled them beyond use, so I used those. Um, and then someone gave me a set of metal straws that came with one of those pipe cleaner thingies. And that's what I use now. And that's great. I feel like that thing will last forever. So that's what I'd recommend. And then the, there was a um, somebody put in the chat that there's a cobbler on Stevens Ave next to Pat's Meat Market. I is I I don't know if that's Portland or must be Portland. Oh, awesome! And and somebody shared a link. Um, so if you go to the chat, you could click on it. It's a myplasticfreelife.com. 
I think they have, I've gone to that before. I think they have lots of good tips mm. on um, yeah. substitutes for different plastic things. So that's all that was in the chat as you were talking. I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and ask Julie a question. Oh, somebody said, do you know about Sugru moldable glue? Yeah, that's a that. great repairable thing. So like uh, you can use Sugru for practically anything. So like if you're, um, you know, uh, like door caddy thing inside your refrigerator breaks and like you're tired of trying to like duct tape it back together and this is obviously a totally hypothetical situation like <laughs> no just kidding like I had this exact situation like you can use Sugru to like fix that and Sugru fixes so many awesome things so it's very durable it's easy to use where do you get it online but uh -huh. I think you probably get it like um I feel like it's gone pretty mainstream so I wonder if you could even acquire it at um Lowe's or Target or big box stores like that which are everywhere so that's a brand name, Sugru? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Oh, can you spell that? It's in the chat, it's S-U-G-R-U-E. Does that sound right, Julie? That sounds right. Yeah. Okay, so S-U-G-R-U-E. Oh, and somebody said that they have their own website, sugru.com. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And Hayes Hardware in Bridgeton. Thank you, Lee. There we go. Yeah. Hayes and you know, Hardware in Bridgeton has it. <laughs> you know, like a quick point too is like if you can buy it, um, anything that you can purchase locally instead of having it shipped to you individually is obviously going to cut down on lots of emissions and fuel usage and packaging and all that kind of stuff too. So, and it supports your local economy. So, whenever you can, I think. Do local. you, do you have a, a good site or something. Um, somebody's asking about what to do with old plastic containers. I mean, there must be millions of things for, depending on the size. Is there a, yeah, a go-to place? Yeah, it depends on what it is. So Lisa, if you want to type, type in the chat like more specifically what you mean by old plastic containers. I mean, I use old, uh, I use the containers that like the salad comes in. Olivia's greens or whatever. Um, I have lots of those and use them for my sewing supplies. Mm. So I have, you know, like zippers in one. And, and so just instead of buying those right. shoe boxy size plastic containers, those are perfect. Mm -hmm. Food storage containers pint, quart, et cetera. So I guess it depends on like what the container is itself, Lisa. So like, you know, if it's something that's like durable, that's going to last for a while, like I would keep using it, you know, maybe not for food after a certain point, like just because plastic starts to break down after repeated washings and depending on how you wash it, like if you wash it by hand, um, it uses more water, uh, than washing something in the dishwasher, but washing plastic in the dishwasher calls, causes the plastic to break down a lot faster. So it will leach into your food, which you don't want. But um, like we, like one of the many compromises that we make here in my household is that we still get takeout and takeout comes, the takeout that we often get, which is from a local restaurant that we really like, comes in like those plastic kind of HDPE plastic things, you know, and we just keep reusing them forever. Like those things are great. We use them all the time. So we'll never need to buy <laughs> food storage ever again, but depending on what it is, like if it's durable like that, that you can keep reusing it, um, especially if you take care of it, that's one thing, but a lot of um, food storage containers are designed to be thrown away. So, you know, like starting at the top of that, like six R's list that we were looking at at the beginning, um, you know, refusing is like number one. So if you can find a way to um, make your purchases that don't come in that stuff, that's obviously the best thing. Um, but if you can recycle it, that's also great. But if it's stuff that can't be recycled or can't be reused, that's a really great um, example of what the extended producer responsibility bill is going to be addressing. So some things you have to throw away, 
Like it's just designed to be trash, which sucks, but is the truth. Do you have a tip about dealing with baking grease or grease when cooking? Somebody had a question without paper towels. Is that kind of the go-to? So depending, depending on what you're doing with it. So like if it's baking grease, you can save that baking grease and use it to make future things like biscuits or roasted vegetables or like a million other things that baking grease can be used for. Um, but if you're talking about like draining bacon, um, my husband does it on bread and then he uses the bread to make other things like stuffing or sandwiches or whatever. So that's something you can do too. Um, and also, um, one final thing is like, if you're cooking in like cast iron and looking for a way to clean the cast iron, um, I have like a little scraper and there's like a million different types of scrapers. You can make your own scraper out of a credit card, but like you can scrape the pan that way too. So if it's something that has to be thrown away after the end of its cooking, um, you can just like scrape it into the trash that way too. Oh yeah, and so um, someone commented on their Pyrex glass containers, how they use it for everything. I feel the same way about mason jars. I use mason jars for everything. Like I'm not even exaggerating. They're food storage, they're beverage containers, they're like to-go containers, they're like my coffee cup, they're like what I put my hankies in, they're what we put our toothbrushes in. Like we use them for everything. They are a full service storage solution. Oh, and I, yeah, I, I store my, um, I make, I make sprouts in it, but I also store my vegetables in them in the fridge, which uh, makes them last a lot longer. So like lettuce goes bad really quickly, but if you put it in a glass jar and put the lid on it, it'll last like four times as long. But you still need to clean the pan. Are you talking about, is this like the bacon grease conversation still about needing to clean the pan? Yeah, I think that's the, the if you've got a really greasy pan, do you sacrifice a rag or do you? just wash it out? I don't do either. So like what I do like with um, grease is I pour it into a jar and then I reuse it for other stuff. Like I said, like for baking or um, uh, roasting vegetables and that sort of thing. And then, so I get everything out of it that I can into the jar. And then I use my scraper to scrape off like any tiny little bits that are left. So does that, does that answer that question? And then I, and, um, and then Deanna mentioned um, finding a local dairy farmer for milk. And then you can bring your own jar, make your own yogurt, no cartons, no plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, how much recycled materials actually get recycled? Not that much. It's really depressing. So, uh, you know, like as much as you can avoid recycling, the better. Cause like we talked about, you know, really briefly, like a lot of recycled materials gets recycled once downcycled into one item. And then that is the end of its life cycle. So like plastics, um, certain types of plastics are recycled and turned into that like plastic composite lumber, like the decking lumber, but that is the end. Like after that, it can't be recycled again. So it can be recycled once and then it becomes trash. And that's like a best case scenario. Like a lot of stuff doesn't get recycled and there's not much of a market for recycling stuff anymore. It's a very volatile market. It goes up, it goes down. And when it goes down enough and things stockpile, things go to the landfill. Or if there's contamination within those recycling materials, it goes to the landfill. So recycling is great, but it's not a perfect solution. It would be a great solution if we were creating a lot less materials that needed to be recycled. Then the market would be a lot stronger for those recycled materials. And there was a tip that um, with the scrubbies you can buy at farmer's markets, like a homemade scrubby and Dawn soap that it washes the grease away fine. But you don't want to wash all the grease out of your cast iron pan. It's awesome for your cast iron pan. It's like a, it's like a spa day. True, right if you have cast iron. <laughs> Somebody, oh, somebody's asking <laughs> for your website again, Julie. What's it's, your website again? It's zerowasteme.org. Okay. 
And my daughter suggests that you, you have an Instagram presence. I don't know how much social media I, you do, Julie. I, but. I, I do not use it very often. For a while, uh, Suzanne was posting a lot of content on there, but she's kind of like stepped back. And I am just not a social media. I hear you. Yeah. So <laughs> there's occasionally content on there, but it's, yeah. it's a pretty quiet presence. But there's lots of really great Instagram accounts that make lots of awesome zero waste content that I <laughs> would recommend more than I would my own. <laughs> Somebody's saying they love cottage cheese. It's all packaged in plastic. Any ideas? You can make your own cottage cheese. Like, like I feel like things like that, if there's something that you really love, like try it. Yeah. And it's, it's actually a pretty easy um, cheese to make on like aged cheeses. Like those fresh cheeses are pretty simple. So it's kind of fun too. You get to learn how to make it. And if I don't know if there's anything on your website about helping kids, mm. teaching kids or helping kids in the classroom. Somebody was looking for tips on that. Yes. So I keep mentioning Suzanne, my, my friend who helped me found this, but she is a school teacher. And so um, we had really hoped once things started ramping up a little bit that we'd be doing classroom outreach. But of course the pandemic has changed all of that. Um, Hopefully at some point um, we can return to that. We were just talking a lot with teachers right before everything started. But if you are a teacher or you know a teacher and want to have, um, and they want to have like ideas or anything, um, they can certainly reach out to us. And there's a teacher in Maine whose name I can't remember, but I feel like if you actually just Googled zero waste teacher in Maine, um, she's awesome. She's doing lots of great work. So there are people out there too. Right. And somebody did say you could find chain mail type cleaners oh, yeah. for cast iron. Right. We have one of those and I so, forget about it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I feel like um, people need to go and I thank you so much, Julie, for all of your information. Lots of thank yous in the chat and um, keep the conversation going at the, at the libraries. Um, I know we have quite a few books that would help people break away from plastics um, and, and move towards zero waste. Lots of cool books on mending your clothes in decorative ways and fun ways. And I'm sure Charlotte Hobbs has lots of good things too. So mm -hmm. use those local resources. Thank you so much for having me. And thank, thank you, so you everybody, everybody for joining everybody. us. Have a great night. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.